Hi, I'm Pamela Reichman, and it is my great pleasure to host this Maximizing Your Network panel. First, I'm going to introduce our incredible panelists. On my right, we have Janet Hansen, the founder of 85 Broads. Widely respected as a leading entrepreneur, Janet is recognized as a unique voice and champion for women globally. Founded in 1997, 85 Broads has become a global network of 30,000 trailblazing women who are invested in each other's professional and personal success. Janet also has a wonderful background in finance. To her right, we have Rachel Sklar. Rachel is a writer and social entrepreneur based in New York. She's the co-founder of Change the Ratio, which increases visibility and opportunity for women in tech and new media and co-founder of The List. A former lawyer who writes about media politics, culture, and technology, she was a founding editor at Mediaite and The Huffington Post. She speaks widely at conferences, events, and on TV. And finally, over here, behind door number three, we have Celine Rattre, who is co-president of Maven Pictures, a New York-based film development, production, and financing company formed in partnership with Trudy Styler. She's produced 30 independent films over the last decade, including 12 Sundance Film Festival and five Toronto titles. Retre produced The Kids Are All Right, and her upcoming film, which is called Black Nativity, is coming out over Thanksgiving. So it's a pleasure to meet you ladies. I'm Pamela Reichman. I'm a freelance writer, mostly for The New York Times, and the author of Stiletto Network, Inside the Women's Power Circles That Are Changing the Face of Business. It was published in May. And I'm going to give you a little background and context for this panel. What I found in Stiletto Networks is that the last few years have seen an explosion of women's dinner groups and networking circles. Right now, this is happening among women in all industries and in all age groups, and it's happening in every major American city and globally, too. What we're seeing is that women are now doing what men have done since time immemorial, which is to merge business and friendship and to capitalize on those connections. Women are now doing deals not for affirmative action or with some altruistic intent to lift up the gender, but because it is smart business with people we know and trust. So for the first time in history, women are seeing a monetary return on time invested with our girlfriends. So with that, Let's jump into talking about networking. So one of the things that I found um, is that, particularly when you are an entrepreneur, you are obliged to reach out more broadly to build your network. And all three ladies here have launched their own ventures. So when you're in the corporate realm, I found that you, know, you, can, you can please your boss and manage the five people under you, and you can still survive. But when you're an entrepreneur, you've got to hustle, and you've got to reciprocate. So I'd love for each of our participants to talk about their experiences building their enterprises, but also how their networks contributed to that. Janet? Is this is, um, yes, yes, good. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, Pamela, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I had uh, the great honor to be, um, to be mentioned in Pamela's wonderful book, The More Stiletto than Network. Um, great book. Um, you know, very interestingly, I spent my first 11 years of my career at Goldman Sachs. So I went to Columbia Business School when I was 22, got to Goldman as a full-time associate at the age of 24. Um, so I built a network um, of pretty interesting people um, throughout the firm and then started my own asset management company, um, ran that for, um, I guess, eight to 10 years, built that successfully and also reached out to people that I had cultivated in my prior life at Goldman, um, and then launched 85 Broads in 1997, and the whole focus and purpose was I wanted to create my own version of utopia, because I said I only want to live in a world where women collaborate with each other. And the best example that I could possibly give of somebody who has networked very successfully, um, who I have great admiration for, is Shauna May. And uh, Shauna is in her late 20s. Uh, she started a company called AHA Life. She spent two years at Goldman Sachs in the investment banking division as a tech analyst. And when she launched her company, um, she came and chatted with me about what she wanted to do. And I said, reach right back into Goldman Sachs, talk to the, the people that you cultivated there, get them to invest in your company. So I think my take on networking 
um, is to cross industry. Um, if you're in fashion, no people in finance. Um, you know, if you're building uh, an online, uh, you know, media company, no people in finance. So I think it's really, really super important to point out because I would imagine that the vast majority of women in this room are probably not working for an investment bank on Wall Street, but I bet you all have friends who are. So I would cultivate that network, um, and there are many, many obviously wonderful women uh, who work on the street, but I think most of my success comes from cultivating a network um, of peers and partners um, and that's what allowed me to go on and build a lot more things over the course of my professional career. So it's so interesting hearing uh, Janet talk about how she began because there are a lot of similarities in how I started here. I came to New York in 1998, so I basically am just having my 15 year anniversary here in the city. Aww. Um, I try not to think <laughs> too hard about how long 15 years is. Um, but I came as a lawyer. I came uh, with a, a very few people in my network. They were all people I went to law school with. I didn't really know that many people in, in, in the city. And for my first year in New York, my life was all about law firm culture and the people I knew from law school and their friends at their firms and what young lawyers were doing. And I quickly figured out that that was not where I wanted to be. I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I always knew that I wanted to do sort of more creative stuff. I wasn't really sure in what area, maybe movies, maybe comedy. I didn't really know. And so I, in order, when I finally decided to leave law, I wanted to try and actually be a freelance writer. And so I reached back into my college network. So I went to college, I went to law school, and then I moved to New York, and I reached back into my college newspaper network because those were the only connections I had in media at all, were, uh, were people who wrote for the Gazette at the University of Western Ontario. And fortunately, some of them were in, you know, at, at place to different newspapers. This was when newspapers were a really big deal, guys. <laughs> and, uh, and one of them was at the National Post. And so I, I was able to place my first actual story and get my first actual byline through that connection. And, but I didn't actually know anybody in New York media. Uh, I actually didn't really, I, don't, I mean, I really honestly, like, I just didn't really know anything, I have to be honest. And, uh, I, I, and, and so I happened to find online, because I was reading a story and I did one of those, you know, I clicked through another link about something called Media Bistro which was an organization for media people in New York. And I clicked through and I saw that they had classes. And so I was like, all right, well, I don't really know what I'm doing. And I, like, I don't know what this class is. It costs 400 bucks. At this point, I was still a lawyer. So I, you know, 400 bucks was like, ah, I spent 400 bucks, who really cares? Those days ended pretty fast, but <laughs> at the lawyer stage, it was all very fun. Um, and so I signed up for this Media Bistro class because I figured, even if the class was terrible and the people were terrible, I could say, look, I am investing in myself and I am doing a thing and it would enhance my credibility in the New York media scene. And so it was January 2002, I showed up at the very first class and there was you know, a num you know, another number of other people in the class. One of the people in the class was a woman named Glynis McNichol who it took until about six weeks into the class for her to mention that she was Canadian. And since I'm Canadian, I got really excited. I was like, you're Canadian? We're going to be best friends. And she sort of looked at me like, you're crazy. And she's been looking at me like, you're crazy <laughs> ever since, because she and I have been friends and colleagues throughout that time. And as we both were working to be writers and figure out how to play stories and work within the media world, we would help each other and we would connect with each other and bring each other to events and you know, critique each other's works or, or make suggestions. And that sort of grew into us working together. We were both founding editors at Mediaite. We worked together at the Huffington Post. And when I started doing a lot of the focusing on women and networking with women, she was the one who said to me, this is getting big. You're spending 100% of your time on it. You, like you always talk about how you want, you know, how you want to start a business. N now is the time. And I said, well, I don't want to do it alone. So you have to do it with me. And that is how I found my co-founder, who was here, and she would hate it if I pointed at her. But I'm going to. Hi, Glynis. 
Um, so I think that, that that's the way the most valuable connections are made, is by, like, I really like how, what Pamela said about the friendship thing, about, about actually benefiting from hanging out with your girlfriends. I think it's really important not to go out and seek to network like a, like, you know, like a heat-seeking missile, who can be useful to me? You know, you can be useful to anybody that you're friends with in all sorts of unexpected ways. And I think that the, the best way to truly grow your network is to do so authentically with people who you actually like and who have reason to actually like you because you're just not just looking to use them. Um, these are great stories. Um, I have a similar story in terms of starting in a big company. When I, was, when I first moved to New York, I worked for HBO um, for three years. And what was interesting about HBO and networking when you were at HBO is everyone wants to network with you. So when you're part of a big company, you call people, everyone wants to meet with you, everyone wants to do business with you. And the challenge when you leave a big organization, and, and I, I left and started a, a little production company, no one returns your calls, no one wants to network with you, and, and life is so much harder when you're an entrepreneur. Um, I started a film company after leaving HBO with um, a, a business partner who was a friend that I had met a year before at a birthday dinner. She was sitting opposite me, and I agree with you about people that you hit it off in a very authentic way because we had a great time at this dinner, stayed in touch, became friends, and then decided to start a production company together. And our biggest challenge when we started the company is, is no one was returning our calls, no one wanted to, um, to, to work with us. And being a film producer is so much about building a network because you are looking for scripts, so you're trying to find screenwriters who've written things that you like. You are um, looking for directors to direct the movies. Um, you're looking for the money to finance your films, the actors to be in the film. And so, so much of it is about network, and it's, it's very, very challenging when you're starting from scratch. So when we started, we were basically just looking for script or for movie ideas everywhere and asking friends and trying to find out what there was out there, reading a ton of scripts, most of which were, were pretty dreadful. Um, and the first movie that we made was actually um, a, a writer who was a part-time writer because he, uh, his main profession was selling uh, cupcakes at Magnolia Bakery. And that's where we met him, and he'd written, he asked us to read a script, and he'd actually written this beautiful, beautiful script, which was, we felt was a, a gem. Um, so we had our script, so, so next we ne needed to find our director, and, and we really felt that Steve Buscemi would be the right kind of director for it, because the tone was a, a mix of comedy and drama, and we felt that he really would understand that tone. Um, so we had to get it to Steve Buscemi, which, which was very challenging. Um, so Steve Buscemi had an agent at Endeavor, um, and the agent was not calling us back, so we asked the agent's assistant if he could read the script just as a favor, and we were really nice to him on the phone, when probably most people you know, never spoke, you know, were rude to him or, or never took the time to speak to him. So he actually read the script and liked it, and basically begged his boss to look at it, and the boss looked at it, and he liked it, and gave it to Steve. And Steve read it two days later and asked to meet with us. And we were at a meeting, literally not able to speak. We were so intimidated. Um, but Steve said he wanted to direct it, which was really exciting. And then life got easier at that point because we had someone with leverage on our project. And Steve sent it to Liv Tyler and to Casey Affleck, who both said they wanted to do it. So at this point, we were so thrilled and really thinking, wow, producing is really easy. Um, and once we had Liv Tyler and Casey Affleck on board, there was a company um, called United Artists, and the head of the company, Bingham Ray, who, who's an amazing filmmaker, said, I love the script, I'm going to make it, you know, you guys get $5 million uh, to do the film. So we were, you know, celebrating, drinking champagne, um, and then we were starting pre-production two weeks later, and one week before the start of pre-production, we read in the newspapers that Bingham Ray had left United Artists. So my business and I, partner and I turned to each other, we thought, hmm, that, that can't be good for us. Um, and we called his right-hand guy who said, no, your project is no longer a priority for us, so uh, good luck making the film. Um, and at this point, we needed to find the money to make the film within days because we were gonna lose both actors to other movies um, uh, if we didn't start pre-production right away. So at that point, we just called every person we knew, asked for advice, you know, asked, you know, just really reached out the, the best we could to our network. And um, we had a lawyer at the time who said, well, I know a film financing company, 
and their budgets are $300,000 per film, so, so less than a tenth of, of uh, what, what, what we had with uh, United Artists. But we thought, well, why not? We'll, we'll give it a try. We sent them the script, and they said they liked it. So we ended up making that movie for $300,000, which was a lot tougher than it would have been for $5 million. But we got the film made, and it went to Sundance, and it sold to IFC Films, and uh, was a lovely, tiny film that very few people saw. But, but that was our start. And then from that point onwards, it was still tough, but a little bit easier. It was called Lonesome Jim. And that eight people saw it. No, but this is really interesting because it's a nice segue into my next question, which is how do you define networking? And, and you all sort of touched on this, but I think a lot of people think about networking as kind of a cheesy and slick thing too. I was told by so many women in the course of reporting Stiletto Network, you know, well, don't call me a good networker because that, that implies I'm not genuine. And um, you know, other people think about networking as walking into a room of 100 strangers with your you know, hello, my name is tag on and passing out business cards. It's painful. It's work. And what all of you seem to be saying, it's actually about sort of building and mobilizing real relationships. So how has your approach to networking changed over time, if at all? Is this something you thought about before you had to build your, your various enterprises? So I didn't know what I was until I read The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. And there was that, you know, the part about the maven and the salesman and the connector. And I read the part about the connector, the person who is just like friends with lots of different people and makes introductions and is always collecting people. And, I, and it was a real aha moment for me. And I, I mean, my, I didn't know before that that was a thing and that could be a thing. And, I, and it took me Important about a thing. decade to, and by the way, I first heard of Malcolm Gladwell on the tipping point in a media bistro class. I'm just saying. Um, but, um, but I have now networked, I guess, my way to knowing Malcolm personally and the actual, the, the iconic connector that uh, Malcolm wrote about in the book was uh, uh, Lois Weisberg, the mother of Jacob Weisberg, who is the, I think, the, the executive editor at Slate, who I just ran into in Banff last week. So I think that that's a really good, I mean, I didn't think of this before I said it, you, you were just, um, your question triggered it. But I think that that's a really good sort of um, example of how it can happen. You know, you just never know. Like, I didn't know, I, you know, someone told me about a book that I should read by a guy named Malcolm Gladwell, and so I picked up the book and I read it, and it, it, it sort of, made me realize something about myself. And so I continued to be that person and figure out how to be useful. And I think a lot of it comes from the desire to be helpful. And this is something that women, you know, women are taught to be helpful, to be useful. But I think that the, the challenge with networking is also to recognize that it's extremely valuable. So when you're making these introductions, when you're making these connections, you are providing a service that has actual value, that is providing actual monetary value. You know, an introduction that was made to you provided you with actual money, right? And, and we see that all the time on the list where people make introductions to, you know, where, which get people funded or get people key partnerships or get people key clients. And I think that striking the balance between wanting to be helpful and also knowing that what you're providing is valuable and, and so not to just give it up freely because someone asked you, like that's one of the more challenging things about networking and, and I think it's something to keep in mind. But overall, I think that it's, it's something organic that happens and by the way, if it's not your way of doing things, if it's not natural to you to be super chatty and connect and follow up, like you don't have to do it. It will feel inauthentic. I, think, I do think that the best network happens uh, if you build it around your authentic response to people. I'm going to keep on coming back to that probably. Well, could, yeah. I wanted to say, make one quick comment, which is um, think about whatever you're passionate about as a lab experiment. And 85 Broads was my greatest and grandest experiment. And and it was basically just because I said, you know what? You know, there are all these fabulous women who have had amazing careers at Goldman Sachs and they're all leaving, not because they were unhappy, but you know, the burnout rate um, in the investment banking business is, is pretty high. So eight, 10 years, you're 
probably onto other things. And um, this was when Goldman and a lot of the other big investment banks were starting to hire lots, and I mean thousands of analysts. So they were starting to bring in tons of young people. Many, um, I, I would guess that about half the class were women um, from the, uh, the top undergraduate colleges. So I said, you know, there's a problem here. Um, got all these fabulous young women coming into the firm. You've got women who have been very, very successful at the firm exiting, so you've got a mismatch. And there are not enough senior women at the firm to mentor all these fabulous young women who are coming into the firm. And so I approached Goldman Sachs in 1995, which, again, it feels almost like it, this was the Byzantine era, but it was actually before the internet really existed, and I said, what do you think about this whole idea of connecting current and former Goldman Sachs women together? And I said, what you have to kind of get your head around is thinking about women who were at the firm as alumni, not as former employees. And the answer was, no, no. And, and it was just that at that time in 1995, they couldn't get their head around thinking of ex-employees as alumni of the firm. And the person that I was speaking to said there are two reasons, reasons for that. One, um, if you quit, you're probably working for a competitor. Or two, we fired you. In which case, either case, we don't wanna, we don't wanna know you. So I said, okay. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go out and do this on my own. And so 85 Broads was something that I created. And when the New York Times did a piece on 85 Broads in 1999, Reed Abelson wrote the story, and I said, do not spin this as a network for bitter babes. I said, if you do that, I'm gonna kill you. And, and, and she didn't, which was awesome. And I think a lot of, of all the good things that have happened in the last 15 or 16 or so years um, is this whole concept of invest in what you love. And my passion throughout my entire tenure at Goldman Sachs, and then when I was the CEO of Milestone, and when I was at Lehman Brothers, was all impacted by my passion to see other women succeed. And my one, the one, the one thing that I would say, because I think it's the most important thing, it's still so incredibly important to me, if you're a mean girl, you will burn in hell. I'm telling you right now, you will burn in hell. If you're mean, if you don't do really great things for other women, trust me, trust me, somebody knows that, <laughs> okay? So it's not sort of like some dopey concept to say, oh, you know, I'm gonna introduce somebody to, you know, somebody who might be a val valuable connection, um, you know, and I'll probably, I don't know what I'm gonna get out of it. Who cares? <laughs> who cares? Do it anyway. Because I think the people that are the most successful over time, and how do I define success? Success to me is being happy. Um, they're, the, they're the givers. They're the ones, you know, who have invested in other, in other people more specifically, in our case, women, um, and are damn glad they did um, because it's a really, really great way to go through life. It's amazing when you see how many... Oh, by the way, let me just say this. I want to go on the record for right now. Gen Y women rock. Okay? Gen Y women rock. Right, I've invested in tons of young women. Right, it's the most exciting thing I've ever done. Um, and so, if anybody is thinking, "Wow, you know, maybe this is a dumb idea. Maybe it's not going to fly." If you're passionate about it, trust me, it'll succeed. We're going to take some questions from the audience, and I have a bunch more questions if you guys don't. So, yes. She wants, she said, we've been talking about success stories. She wants some nightmare stories, some cautionary tales. I, ha I yeah. have lots so of very, great, yeah. very humiliating stories, um, particularly when I started in film um, and, and lessons I've learned from it. When, when I first started in film, I just wanted to meet as many people as possible. I want to meet screenwriters and actors and just be in business with everyone. And um, I went to a panel, um, a, a conference, and heard the uh, writer of Taxi Driver talking about his process and how he wrote. And he finished, he, he spoke for about an hour, 
and finished. And you could tell he just wanted to get out of there. He was just looking at the door, racing towards the door, but I was absolutely determined to meet him. And he left um, and was walking, I think it was on 16th Street, and I physically raced after him in the streets and sprinted after him and cornered him and told him about myself and told him I wanted to work with him. And he was just looking left and right and just trying to get away. And it was so humiliating. And I think the lesson there is, if someone does not want to talk to you, don't force yourself on them. <laughs> um, and then years later, 10 years later, his agent called me and said um, that he wanted to meet with me. And I met with him and I sat there just praying, praying, praying that he would not recognize me. And at one point in the meeting, he said, you look familiar, have we met before? And I decided I was not gonna mention it. Um, but I, I think in terms of um, networking, I think the most important thing is really building genuine connections with people and really trying to figure out what they're trying to accomplish. And I think one, one of the things that, you know, maybe may mistakes I made early on is that I would come up to, come to meetings and have the project I was trying to get made and have my agenda. And, and when you're meeting, particularly when you're meeting with, with creative uh, talent, when, when you're meeting with writers and directors, what you need to find out is what are you looking to do? What, what's your dream project to write? You know, what, 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 what is it that you're trying to accomplish? And let them talk. And if there's something that, if I happen to have a script that is exactly what that director is saying he wants to do, that's great. But if he's saying that he absolutely wants to do a musical and I came with a thriller, don't force that on him. And instead, think about you know, if he wants to do a musical, what musical ideas you have, or three years later you might come up with a musical and at that point reach, reach back out. But really, let, let, let someone else set the agenda in terms of what they're trying to accomplish and, and be open to that and try and be responsive to that. So I, I heard that, that oops, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say that, um, you know, like networking is like dating, right? So everybody's gonna have a bad story about something that didn't work out. But I, I think for me, because now I'm, you know, I'm committed to being in this world, and, and that means one thing that I've realized is that if you're staying in any industry for the long haul, you are going to have an ebb and flow of people who are nice to you and people who aren't nice to you. And the people who aren't nice to you, the mean girls who are burning in hell. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think Janet just made fetch happen, by the way. Yeah. Um, mean girls reference. Um, uh, you know, the, not all of them actually go to hell immediately, right? <laughs> so, i.e., they like you're gonna pat, like you're gonna meet them at events, or you're gonna see them rise. You get this per these people who maybe weren't that nice to you, or who who have always been underminers, or whatever. Like you, you are gonna have to make the decision about whether or not someone who crossed you, or has never been nice to you, or you know isn't that a great, great, great a person, whatever reason, you're gonna have to figure out how to interact with them, and. It's you know, in every case is different. Some in some cases, like for example, there's a, a woman that I, I worked with at a company I was involved with, and I'll just leave it at that. Who was instrumental in in putting the brakes on something in my my career that was going very well, and she didn't disappear into nothingness. I mean, she left that company, joined another company, did another company, and then started reaching out to me, and I would see her at, at lady breakfasts and events and you know and, and she wasn't a bad person she was responding to sort of the impetus of the power structure at that organization and I just sort of had to make the decision to let it go because it was useful to be in touch with her because she was doing cool stuff and because her interest in being in touch with me as I had risen was not only genuine but also sort of satisfying so I think and <laughs> That's very, it's very difficult though. It's really difficult to let go of grudges or to figure out which ones are worth keeping. And, and that's, you know, I'd, I'd love to sit up here and say I've never had a conflict with anyone and everybody's my friend. Um, speaking of musicals, like I, I use the sound of music as my model, you know? <laughs> Just everybody can join into song and probably most, most bad feeling goes away. But, um, but there are people, there are people and I do hold grudges. And, uh, but, I, but as time goes by, that's a useful thing too, is that any time, like when you're at your maddest, it's instructive to just stop and think about whether or not you will care in a year. And probably in a year, that person will actually be so insignificant to you and you will have moved so far past them that they're really not worth the energy. But that's, I think, that's the downside of sort of the relationships that you form in your professional path. And, and it's like they're genuine bad feelings and you have to genuinely figure out how to get past them. Next question. 
I can repeat it if the other folks stand here. I just think it's you know it's it's something that does have value and, and I'm not saying don't give it away for for free to people that you work with and you know but you know like I've I get requests to pick my brain from people I don't know they want they want me to come sit down with them so they can ask me all sorts of questions that will provide them with value from my answers my hard won experience over the years, right? Or make introductions. And depending on who that person is, what my connection is to them, how they came to me, yeah, I mean, it, it depends. And, and I think uh, I think that I'm, I'm, this isn't a, like a, a men versus woman thing at all, but I've had a lot of men do that. There's like sort of an expectation that's, I'm gonna, you know, I'm just gonna take it to Cheryl. Cheryl talks about this in her book, that there, it's called the gender discount, where women are expected, just from sort of societal norms, to be healthy and to provide stuff. Whereas men, for men to do it, there'll be, a, you know, there'll be gratitude and or financial compensation. So all I'm saying is, I'm not saying don't be helpful, don't be useful. I'm saying it has value, and when you know, and to be aware of the fact that your, you know, your introduction of someone who's starting a company to a whole bunch of VCs. That's not just you being nice and making introductions. In the world of startups, that's an advisor role that has equity attached to it. So it's useful to know that. And the, again, I, I, these are hard-won lessons. This comes from me having made those introductions and not knowing that. So now that I do know that and I see the opportunities I missed, I, I just consider it a bit of a duty to sort of go out there and, and point it out so that all of you who might be letting people sit and pick your brains for hours might realize that what you're actually doing is giving away free consulting services. Next question. Hi. <laughs> um, my question um, is, I'm always introducing people. Right here. I'm always introducing people. It's, it's, it's my gift, and it's funny that you mentioned the word connector, because the only time I had ever heard it was when one of my former bosses told me to take a test in StrengthsFinder. And that was the first thing that came as my, one of my, my number one skill, which was connector. And I've always been connecting people, and I've married people. And I'm very proud of that because I think that that's karma that comes back to you. Um, but I have a question. So my somebody at work knows this quality of me, and she said to me, "You really shouldn't introduce people or connect people unless they ask you to, because there's no upside for you, and you know you really shouldn't do things like that for people. And there are people who believe that you really shouldn't introduce other people because they're worried that if something doesn't go right, it's going to come back to them. What do you feel about that? Should you?" Do, do, you, do you feel like you go out there and make the introductions even if no one's asked you, or you think you should, people should ask you for them before you actually offer them help? For, for me personally, I, I love putting people in touch, and I think if something is, generally things don't go wrong if it's people that you know and people that you like, that you think are, are like-minded. Um, and if something were to go wrong, I, I, I don't think you get blamed. I think sometimes businesses go wrong, and that's, you know, there's lots of reasons why that hap happens. But I try whenever, you know, last night I was at a dinner and there's a woman who's moving from Australia to New York and starting a jewelry business. And I said, oh, you have to meet these three people. You know, I, I love putting people in touch. And it's such a lovely thing to do. And I usually think those things come around and people do that to you. And in fact, I see my friend Marisa here who is a really talented, talented uh, writer who wrote a book that I adored. And um, I had tried to option it, but it was optioned at the time. And then I bumped into a mutual friend of ours at a party. And we ta started talking about her. And she said, oh, the rights are available. Let me put you guys in touch. And she put us in touch the next day. And now we're doing the project together at HBO Films with Kate Blanchett starring. And those kind of things happen because people have been generous to me and it's something that I want to do for other people. So I, for me personally, it's do it as much as you can, but do it in ways where you really think through, you know, does it make sense for these people to, to be in touch and is there a good fit and will something good come out of it? And also in Stiletto Network, I interviewed women from their 20s to their 70s and I actually found that the most successful 
and appreciated networkers are people who, as Celine was talking about, as you guys were saying, really lead by giving and who see opportunities for others before they see them for themselves. And also, I think a great point was that someone said, you know, it raises your stock to be the connector. If you are the person who has put these two people in touch and it's created a valuable interaction for both, then again, it's more than karma, it's, it's actual value in the world. And then you get to brag so, about it when it goes well. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been being told to wrap up. So this has been a wonderful panel. Thank you, Celine, Rachel, and Janet for your insight. There's something we can all learn about networking from these tremendous women.